Jesus' name, amen. If you would, would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Chapter 20, we're looking this morning at verses 11 through 15. And the title of our message is The Great White Throne Judgment. That's a mouthful, isn't it? The Great White Throne Judgment. Well, the next thing to happen on the prophetic scene is the rapture of the church, in which Jesus Christ will come for the church, take us back to heaven to be with him. And that could happen at any moment. And there really is nothing that needs to happen before this can happen. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. And the church has been waiting for that moment for a long time. But once the church has been removed, there will then be a seven-year tribulation upon this earth, a squeezing, if you would, to bring those who would come to Christ, to Christ, as well as the judgment of the unbelievers, those that refuse. And then Jesus Christ will return to this earth at the end of that seven-year tribulation period with the church, and he will at that point raise all of the Old Testament saints whose bodies are in the grave, and all the tribulation saints, those who gave their lives to Christ and lost their lives during the tribulation, he will raise their bodies from the dead. And that completes what is known as the first resurrection. It's a resurrection of believers. And we read about that last week in chapter 20, verse 6, where the apostle John said, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power. But they, those of the first resurrection, shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And so when Jesus returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, he will set up his kingdom on this earth and rule and reign from the city of Jerusalem for 1,000 years, and all believers will rule and reign with him. And that's what's known as the millennial reign of Christ. And then we read in Revelation 20, verse 5, but the rest of the dead, the unbelievers, did not live again until the 1,000 years were finished. And so at the end of the 1,000-year reign of Christ on this earth, all dead believers of all time from Adam all the way through the entire Old Testament, through the church age of which we're part of, through the seven-year tribulation, and even through the 1,000-year reign of Christ on this earth, will be raised from the dead. Those that died in unbelief will be raised from the dead and stand before God's judgment seat. And here's the account that God gives us of this. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, for there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so there will be, after the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth, a second resurrection, a resurrection of all dead believers of all time. And the books will be opened, and they'll be judged by God at what the Bible calls the great white throne judgment. And they will be cast into the lake of fire, which the Bible calls the second death. This, this ought to frighten us. This is a message about hell, and it's from Jesus Christ, the author of the book of Revelation. Did you know that Jesus talked more about hell than anybody else in the Bible? You know why? Because he doesn't want us to go there. This is a warning to those that don't know where they're going to end up, as well as a blessing to those who do, who have made the decision for Christ. But hell's a real place. Listen to what Jesus said while he was here on this earth to those who were here at the time about this. In Matthew 7, 13, Jesus said, Enter in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who are going that way, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few that find it. The way that a lot of people are going is the broad way, but there's a narrow way 
It's through Jesus Christ. And so there are two paths. And the question this morning is, which one are you on? And then in Mark chapter 9, verse 42, Jesus said this, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble. Anybody that would seek to try and destroy the faith of, of a child of God, he said it'd be better for them that a millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Then he said, if, you're, if your hand makes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter into life maimed than having two hands and go to hell. And then he says, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm does not die, the fire is not quenched. And if your foot makes you to sin, then cut it off. It's better to enter into life lame than having two feet and be cast into hell, into the fire which never quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye makes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to, for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Six times Jesus mentions there the fire of hell. Five times we're told that that fire never goes out, and three times it says where the worm does not die. That's a reference to man and his nature. This is not my opinion. That's what Jesus said. And then Jesus talked about a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus who died Listen what he said in Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple, fine linen, and he fared sumptuously, sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who laid at the rich man's gate. He desired to be filled with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked up his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, he lift up his eyes, and he saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, you in your lifetime received all good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and you are tormented. And besides this, there's this great gulf affixed between the two of us so that no one can pass from there to here and no one can pass from here to there. And then this rich man said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house for I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest he also come to this place of torment. That's the third mention of torment now. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. They've got the Bible. People have talked to them. They've had their opportunity. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes and, and from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And isn't that true? Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, and people are unwilling, many of them, to listen. But there are two paths and two destinies in life. Let's look first at the one who judges in verse 11. John, remember he's an eyewitness to this, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was no place for them. So demonstrative is this scene that heaven and earth flees away. Well, who exactly is on this throne? Listen carefully what Jesus said. For the Father judges no one. This is John 5, 22. But he's committed all judgment to the Son. How would you like to stand before Jesus Christ, the one that died for our sins, who poured out his life for us face to face on that day, having rejected his generous offer of salvation? It's Jesus Christ who's on this great white throne. He's the judge. And then Jesus went on to say, for as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son to have life in himself. He has given authority to execute judgment also. Why? Because he is the Son of Man. And so a man will sit on this throne, but not just a man, God who took on human form, both God and man, Jesus Christ, so that no one can say, yeah, he doesn't understand. A man will judge men, one who's been here, one who knows, one who understands. The point is that Jesus Christ here is the judge. 
He's the one sitting on this great white throne. Now, the throne in heaven is mentioned 45 times in, in the book of Revelation, but this is not that throne. This is the judgment throne. It's, it's great, not because of its size, but because of the issues that it deals with. It's white because of the purity and righteousness of Jesus Christ, the one who sits on it and judges. And just the presence of him who's on this throne is so powerful that the heavens and the earth flee from its presence. Probably the most awesome moment in, ever in history. You know, we've been hearing about the coming judgment, the day of judgment, and now it's here and there's no escaping it. And heaven and earth flees from the presence of God. Wow. Wow. Can you imagine? This is not the place you want to be. And it appears that this great white throne is neither on heaven and earth. Heaven and earth have fled away, just kind of out there in space. And the picture here is that when the judgment day comes, there'll be nowhere to hide. Nowhere. Just a look from him. And, and the earth and the heaven flee away. And it's just you and God. And the books are opened. In verses 12 and 13, let's look at the ones who were judged. And I, John, just John the apostle, saw the dead small and great. You know, a person's position in life will not help them. Are you a millionaire? So what? Are you a king? Who cares? Are you famous? Hey, what was your name again? Does everybody understand? God is not a respecter of people. No one will stand before the judge of all the universe and start dropping names that won't help. Hey, shouldn't I get special favor? I was the president of the United States at once. No. We came into this world naked, and we're going out naked. We're talking here about all unbelievers who ever lived in the same boat, standing before God. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Now, you normally sit while you're being tried but here they've already been tried. You stand in order to receive your sentence. Listen carefully to what Jesus, or John, the, uh, John uh, who wrote the book of John said. He said, God so loved the world. This is one we all are familiar with, John three sixteen. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Where did we ever get that idea? but that the world through him might be saved. And then he said, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because they've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so when a person refuses Jesus Christ, they've already been tried. Only sentencing now remains. And the books were opened. You mean it's not hearsay? No. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And all the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. And so the first thing we notice here about the great white throne judgment is that it's going to be God's analysis of a person's life and works and not theirs. Nobody's going to be telling God all the wonderful things they did to get into heaven. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul said to the church there, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. No one's ever fooled God. And then Hebrews 4, 13, There's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are open and naked to the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Jesus knows the things they did, the things they didn't do, even things they don't know. And evidently, God keeps good records. The books were opened. And those that stand before him will have no defense on that day, no good reason for rejecting his offer of salvation. They'll be speechless. But notice that the judgment is according to their works, both in verses 12 and verse 13. And just as believers will be judged for their deeds, you know, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne, but to receive, our, our sins have already been paid for. Not to be judged for our sins, but to be rewarded for, for, for our faithfulness to what God's given us. God's given us a space between the time we get saved until we're, we either die and go home to be with the Lord or the rapture of the church to work for Him, to be about our Father's business. 
and we'll be, you know, according to the opportunities and giftings, rewarded accordingly to our faithfulness. And we will all as believers stand before that. And just as believers are going to be judged for their deeds and to receive rewards one way or the other, so God will judge the unbeliever. Not for eternal separation. That's already been sealed by their unbelief. But for degrees of punishment, you say, where in the world do you see that? Listen carefully. Jesus, again, he's, a, he's, he's the foremost uh, expert on this. Matthew eleven twenty. he began to upbraid, Jesus did, the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. Why? Because they didn't repent. He said, woe to you, Chorazin, and woe to you, Bethsaida. Those are cities he did a lot of wonderful things in. If the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, if that was a, this had happened in some, some pagan Gentile city, you know, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it'll be more toler tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. There's degrees of judgment and punishment. And you, Capernaum, you know what that city, the significance of that is? That's where Jesus set up shop. Every day they watched him come, they watched him go, they heard him. Who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have been it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? And then in Luke chapter 12, verse 47, Jesus said that the servant who knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things worthy of stripes will be beaten with few. Why? For everyone to whom much is given, much will be required. There are degrees of punishment. Some will get many stripes, others will get few stripes. And, you know, we leave that with the judge, don't we? He knows the truth. He knows the details, the circumstances. And so according to verse 12, there are books, books that have everything written in them. Books about believers and books about unbelievers. And it's interesting, the word written here literally means that which stands written. But there's one book that really matters, and that's the book that has your name in it, the book of life. It's mentioned a number of times in the Bible. It contains the, the, the name of all true believers, and you will absolutely not make it into heaven if your name's not written there. The sea, look at verse 13, gave up the dead who were in it. You were buried at sea? That doesn't get you out of this. You know, I think this is God's way to remind us that if you were buried at sea or you were cremated and your ashes were, were scattered on the ocean, it doesn't matter. God knows where you are. And you'll also stand before the great white throne. There's no judgment. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each according to his works. Now, the Bible speaks of two kinds of death. There's physical death which because man is a body, soul, and a spirit, soul and spirit are the immaterial part of man, and the body, which is this, and, and, and physical death is a separation of those things. The soul and spirit are separated from the body. The body goes into the grave. It goes back to the ashes. And the, and the spirit and soul of a believer in Jesus Christ automatically goes to be with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You've read about it. But there's also the physical death uh, that happens to an unbeliever. The same thing happens. The body goes into the grave awaiting the resurrection. It goes back to the dust. But the spirit and soul, they don't go to be with the Lord. They go to a holding place presently that's called Hades. The unbelieving dead are all there, including Cain, Hitler, Judas, all the unbelieving dead uh, that were killed in the flood. Can you imagine? There's physical death, and then there's spiritual death, which is separation from God eternally, where the, the person, body, soul, and spirit is standing before God after the resurrection, the second resurrection of unbelievers, and will be cast into the lake of fire eternally. That's the second death. So you die a physical death, 
and your body uh, it goes into the grave awaiting the resurrection, and your soul uh, of the unbeliever goes to in this terrible holding place where there's torment. We read about it in Luke chapter 16. Jesus talked about it. And then at the end of the thousand years, there's a second resurrection, and then your soul and body will be raised together, with, uh, together to stand before the great white throne judgment. And then you'll be cast into the lake of fire. And you know who's there already? The false prophet, the antichrist, and Satan will be cast into there. This is not a place anybody wants to go. And it was a place that said, Jesus said, was prepared for the devil and his angels. And if you want to go that way, the way of rebellion, then that's where you'll go. But God doesn't want anybody going there, obviously. God's not wanting that any should perish. All should come to repentance. You know, this is a message of love. God so loved us that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And just as spiritual life is conscious existence and communion with God, so too spiritual death is conscious existence but in separation from God. Don't believe for a moment when people tell you that, oh, if you die, it, everything just fades away as nothing. That's called annihilationism, and it's a lie from the pit. It's a lie from the pit. God so loves us, he's going to tell us about this. So two resurrections Jesus talked about. The resurrection of a just and the resurrection of the unjust. They're separated by a thousand years. Now some have already been resurrected. Jesus, of course, was the first to rise from the dead, never to die again. He's called the first fruits. There were those souls and spirits of those in that day, we believe the Old Testament saints, that went to be with him in paradise. They were raised with him, and they're with him in his presence right now. Their bodies are still in the graves, and their bodies won't be raised until the end of this tri tribulation because they're not the church. And they'll be raised along with the tribulation saints. That completes, and then we in the middle of that, seven years before uh, Christ returns a second time, before the tribulation starts, the dead in Christ will be raised first. Church-age believers will rise first and we will rise with them and be changed, not having died. It's a blessing, you know. But that will complete the first resurrection. The second one doesn't happen for a thousand years and it's all unbelievers. But let me remind you, whether we're talking about physical or spiritual death, it's all the result of sin. Everybody dies, amen? It's all proof. Romans 5, 12, Paul said, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world. Who is that one man? Adam. And death through sin. It's the result of it. Thus death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. That's why we need to come and be born again. So we don't have to die at that eternal separation. Now in verses 14 and 15 is the judgment. Then death and Hades, that waiting place for all the unbelieving dead of all time, which is a place of torment. We read about it. We're cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Wow. And think about that. For how long has this, this has been going on for at least, well, 6,000 years, ever since man has, has been here on this earth and, and there's been unbelievers 6,000 years waiting, knowing that what's on the other side is, 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 is more of this. The first death is physical. The second death is eternal. You know, that's why we need to solve the problem before we die. God has given us uh, an entire lifetime to make that decision. And I thank God for every person who stops us in the way and, and tries to tell us about Jesus or gives us a Bible tract or every, every person that's ever invited us to church to try and get us saved. Thank God for every one of those people, you know, that stood in the way between us and hell in, in behalf of Jesus Christ. 
And it's, it says here that the second death is a lake of fire, and a lot of people don't want to believe that it's true. The English word hell is used in the Bible uh, 54 times. The lake of fire is only used four times. It's in the book of Revelation alone. But this place is described. There's a temporary holding place called Hades. Hell is real. It's eternal. It's, 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 it says weeping and gnashing of teeth. Can you imagine that? Why? Because you're, you're alive and experiencing this. Like the rich man, his, his tongue was burning. It's called outer darkness. You know, light came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. Men rejected the light because they uh, were pleased to dwell in the darkness and do their sin. So God says, if this is what you want, this is what you'll get. But I, that's not my choice for you. That's your choice. Wow. It's called everlasting punishment and tormented day and night. There's another word in the Bible, Gehenna. You've heard that word? It's an Aramaic word translated by the English word hell. Hades is that temporary holding place. Hell is the eternal one or Gehenna, whichever you'd like. But, Ge but Gehenna is, is the word, it means the Valley of Hinnom. And in the city of Jerusalem, alongside of it, there was a dump, one huge incinerator, and they would take and dump all, everything would come out of the dung gate in the city of Jerusalem and all the trash and the dead animals and, and even human beings that, that nobody cared for and didn't have the means for a proper burial. They were thrown there, and it was a continual place of burning. You know, I, I remember back in... Uh, 1957 in, in Pico Rivera in our backyard. We didn't have trash collection. We had an incinerator. And man, we loved to go out there and watch the, the stuff burn, you know. But this is an incinerator outside of the city of Jerusalem that everybody knew about, and there was a continual smoke from the burning of this, and Jesus compared that to hell. That's what hell's going to be like. That's Gehenna, a literal place. And notice verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into that lake of fire. You know, a lot of people unfortunately believe that because they've done a few good things or even a lot of good things that they're not going to go to hell. That is not true. That's a lie from the devil. The issue here is whether or not our name is written in the book of life. That's what's important. And for our name to be written in the book of life, we must believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead. It's that simple. And receive him into our lives. There's no other way. The way is narrow. Well, what do you mean? Well, you've got to receive Jesus Christ. You can't get there through Buddha. What's Buddha the God of? Gluttony? I don't know. <laughs> or, or any of the multiplicity of gods that are out there, they're all dead. Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. He's alive. He's the only true and living God. Amen? Amen? Jesus said this, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, didn't we do all of these wonderful things? And isn't that the truth? I can't tell you how many people have said they, they, because they've done this or they go to church or whatever else, that's salvation. No, it's not. He said, I will declare to them, depart from me. I never knew you. It's personal relationship with Jesus Christ and receiving what he's done. The proverb says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is a way of death. I love when people say, well, you're very narrow-minded. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, because the way's narrow. You know, on the cross, when our sins were dumped on Jesus, who had never he'd been eternally with the Father, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, uncreated from the beginning, before the beginning they existed, when he thought about the separation from his Father that he'd never experienced before, when our sins were dumped upon him, remember he cried on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not because he didn't know why, but because he wanted us to know our sins. And he shuddered at that thought. It was unimaginable to him. We do not want anybody we know to go to this place. But think about who's going to be there. Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, all the wicked demons of hell, Cain, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Judas, Hitler, Stalin. The list goes on and on and on. Jesus died for our sins. And as far as he's concerned, if we go there, we're trespassing. We do not have to go there. Listen carefully. There is a way out of hell, but there's no way out of hell. Does that make sense? And the decision needs to be made now. It's appointed unto man once to live or to die, and then the judgment. And then to the church in Rome, chapter 6, verse 23, Paul said, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we've earned. That's the first scripture I memorized, by the way. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What we've earned because of our sin is death. But God's free gift is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Now, there's, there's light at the end of this tunnel. There's wonderful truth in this for us who are believers. If you are a born-again believer today, then your name is written in the book of life. And it's called not just the book of life, but the Lamb's book of life. Why? To remind us that someone innocent had to die for the guilty. A precious, sweet, innocent little lamb, Jesus. And if up to this point you're not a believer, all you have to do is receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and find out that your name will, has been written in the book of life for eternity. And you know, when the whole thing's said and done, I don't understand everything, obviously. There's a lot I don't understand. When the whole thing's said and done, we will stand back and go, righteous and true are your judgments. You did exactly what you should have done. It was the only right and just thing to do. And nobody's going to be questioning this. For the one doing this and making the judgment is a man, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, for those of us who are here this morning and we've been born again, we've received you as our Lord and Savior, God. We are, we are elated that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and we are not going to go to this place. We just, we, we, we breathe a sigh of relief and we thank you, God. We're going to be thanking you for eternity, for saving our souls. We didn't deserve any of it. And you made a way through Jesus Christ that we might spend eternity with you. Thank you for that, God. We're longing for that. And our hearts and attention now turns to those who are here this morning who may not have, have received you as yet. May be wondering if their names are written in the book of life, but are not sure right at this moment that if they died tomorrow, that they would be with you in heaven in eternity, Lord. Lord, help them to settle the issue right now. Grant them a godly sorrow to repent and to turn away from, from where they are presently and turn towards you. If that's you this morning, you want Jesus Christ, you want to settle the issue right now, you've never received him, would you lift up your hand? And I lift it up high that I can see it. Sometimes I can't see. You lift up your hand if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You never have. Today's your day. Anyone at all. Boy, I hope that every one of you is saved. I don't see any hands here. I hope every one of you is saved. But you know what else that means? That if you're not saved and you're not lifting up your hand, that you've just said no to Jesus and his offer. Don't think about me up here giving you the opportunity. This is Jesus. Now, maybe there's some of you here this morning who who you've received the Lord, that that's a settled issue. You know your name's written in the book of life, but you've not been where you need to be with Jesus, and you'd like to just, just rededicate your life to Christ. Would you lift up your hand? I, I'm suspecting there's several here. Please, God is so faithful. When we make one move or one step towards him to, to come running to us, any more before I pray for you. I want to pray for you. Keep your hands lifted up. You know, God visits the humble. God visits the humble. He resists the proud. 
Don't be so proud that you can't lift up your hand and say, would you help me, Lord? I see more hands going up. You know, my hand's up. Father, I want to lift up these that have lifted up their hands, Lord. And Lord, you know the hearts and, 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 and all. God, would you grant them the peace, the assurance, Lord, a new desire for the things of God, a new desire for your word, Lord. Fill them, God, with your Holy Spirit. Use them in a powerful, mighty way, Lord. Restore them to their first love, Lord. And Lord, if there are things that stand between us and you, Lord, would you give us the, 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 the sense, the common sense and the grace, Lord, to stand away from those things, to put those things away, God, that stand between us and you. Lord, and thank you for your patience with us, God. Lord, we lift up those that we know don't know you, our loved ones, people we work with, our neighbors, Lord, and they're not hearing this. God, help us to tell them, to warn them, to lead them to Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.